Our first speaker uh, for this panel is Erica Benner, representing the Yale Bulldogs. <laughs> I'm glad you knew that, because I really wish I did. <laughs> um, thank you. I want to follow my predecessors in thanking Harvey for the invitation and thanking Anna and everyone else who's helping out with this conference. It's fantastic so far, and I've learned a lot. Um, uh, I took a slightly less erudite approach to this invitation than most people who've already spoken. Um, so this answer might have the feeling more of a kind of debating piece rather than uh, a kind of very learned discourse on whether Machiavelli was a realist or a moralist. Um, so bear with me. Um, most readers of Machiavelli, myself included, agree that he is a realist in the following senses. He regards self-preservation as a basic good for individuals and collective entities, such as peoples, cities, and states. He further holds that to preserve themselves, human beings need to acquire and cultivate various forms of power. In domestic political settings, individual leaders or parties preserve themselves chiefly through networks of supporters, the people, the great, or the soldiers. In foreign relations, cities and states preserve themselves firstly by building strong military forces, secondly by preventing other states from threatening their own interests. Now the end of self-preservation may have a moral dimension, as many people have pointed out. If we use moral to mean broadly a concern for the interests or claims of others when deciding one's own course of action, Machiavelli sometimes suggests that a policy of virtuous self-preservation should promote the interests of at least some others, at least one's own partisans, for example, people versus the great, uh, or more broadly, those of an entire people or state. Now, up to that point, probably most people in this room would agree that some, most of that is uh, what Machiavelli holds in the prints and in the discourses. But beyond this, readers disagree on what Machiavelli considers to be basic human and political realities and on how much room they leave for moral concerns beyond preserving the survival and power of a particular self, individual or collective. On the most usual account of Machiavelli's realism, the fundamental reality is you can't trust others. Uh, Prince chapter 17 says, men generally are ungrateful, fickle pretenders and dissemblers, evaders of danger, etc." Uh, and human nature being what it is, princes have to know how not to be good or risk falling prey to others who are effective users of deception, cruelty, and even evil. So to preserve yourself and your state, you sometimes have to ignore conventional moral rules that say, keep your promises, avoid violence and cruelty, don't take what belongs to others. If you don't molest others, as we read in the discourses, they'll molest you. Now, I agree with this view on one essential point. Machiavelli does teach that you shouldn't trust other people without good reason. Now, this perhaps makes him some kind of realist, but to decide what kind and what kind of morality his realism leaves room for, we need to ask, what does he think is the best response to the fact that human beings aren't naturally reliable? Do we have no choice but to outbad everybody else when we feel threatened, unleashing the untrustworthy sides of our own nature? Or is there another option, perhaps more apt for self-preservation, to exert our less bad capacities for what Machiavelli calls virtuoso ordering and establish new relationships beyond what we find in our nature, relations that make it reasonable to trust at least some others? Now, on a close reading, it seems to me that the prince's position on the relation between trust, political power, and security is extremely ambiguous. Uh, if we go back before the famous shocker passages in chapters 15 to 18, we find a very different take on the question of whether an individual's or a state's security can be built on mistrust of other human beings. In fact, one of the prince's most persistent, powerful arguments is that both individuals and states need other people's firm, reliable support uh, in order to keep them safe. The prince's core middle chapters, 10 to 14, teach new princes how to get their own initially suspect subjects on their side and keep them there. Building relations of mutual trust is essential for this. 
Machiavelli outlines concrete measures that can help build it. At first, he says, you can't trust your own subjects, especially the lowly rabble of plebs, as he calls them, to defend you in necessity. But if a new prince gives them secure work that allows them to feed their families and win public respect, they'll become your state's stoutest defenders, its virtuous arms. So instead of keeping your subjects weak and dependent on your largesse, make them stronger so that they can give you much needed support. For the best quality support comes from people who have enough power themselves to make commitments to you as near equals. Uh, in chapter 10, he says, the nature of men is to be obligated as much by benefits they give as those they receive. So the people need to be empowered enough that they can give you something that you actually need. Um, and here's a very important point for Machiavelli. Other people's support is worth infinitely more when it's willing, not forced, and when it's based on good reasons that hold beyond a particular crisis. Money, for example, can buy you fair weather friends, uh, good appearances and deceptions uh, are eventually exposed. Um, they're not reliable methods. They're methods he associates with the mode of fortuna. Uh, mercenaries have nothing but money to induce them to fight, and money isn't enough, to quote, to make them want to fight for you. For arms to be their your own, your troops have to be willing actively to fight and die for the prince or state. Uh, because they have a real stake in their survival, and not just because you've uh, pressured or manipulated them into fighting for you. So the importance of willing or consent for stable orders is often stated in the discourses and the Florentine histories more explicitly than in the prince. Uh, for example, just a few quotes, not fortresses but the will, voluntà, of men maintains them in their states. Uh, that rule is firmus, that is obeyed gladly. Peace is faithful where men are willingly pacified or from the discourses. Uh, in the Florentine histories, Machiavelli has a prudent character saying that had Florence received a conquered city, Volterra, by accord, she would have gained security from it. But since the city was taken and held by force, it would bring only, quote, weakness and trouble. So all this suggests that, at least at some level in the prince, voluntary mutual obligations an exceedingly important source of political and military power. And it assumes that obligations based on mutual trust can be built up between people who start off not trusting each other, in this case, nude princes and restive subjects. Machiavelli's virtuoso statesmen know how to order new relations that make it reasonable to count on those who once seemed hostile or unreliable. Uh, the Syracuse and Hiro, uh, hero, as uh, John McCormick mentioned as well, is a good example of this in The Prince <coughs> Chapter 6. Uh, after his tyrannical predecessors uh, destroyed trust inside Syracuse and relations with neighbors, Hero establishes a new political and military uh, order that turned uh, downtrodden subjects into proud citizen soldiers. He also rebuilt defensive alliances that were shattered by his undiplomatic predecessors with both Romans and other Greeks and made Syracuse safer. Um, now, but surely some might say it's harder to mitigate mistrust abroad in relation to other peoples and states. So don't the prince's more cynical maxims apply in foreign policy, if not at home? Well, that's not what Machiavelli says in Prince chapter 21. Here he suggests that all states need firm allies to support their own safety or freedom. And he says a lot about how to get allies to trust you enough to support you through thick and thin. The essence of his advice is act in ways that inspire well-founded trust in yourself. If you take clear sides, instead of changing allies according to your temporary advantage, sticking by friends through their defeats as well as through victories, you show yourself worthy of trust. Uh, there's more than a fair chance that these friends will reciprocate and help you out when you're down, since in response to your firm commitments, they form, to quote, uh, an obligation to you, an obligo, and a contract of love for you, contratto lo amore. Even if you're stronger than your allies, you still need to act in ways that keep them willingly in your camp, since fortunes are famously fickle and can always change. And if your allies are stronger than you, than you uh, oblig this obligation restrains them from taking advantage of your relative weakness. Why? Well, because, to quote again, men are never so indecent, dishonesto, as to betray your good faith when you've shown it to them. Now, that gives us a very different 
picture of human nature, the idea that men are so, never so indecent as to betray your good faith, uh, than the wholly pessimistic view stated in chapter 17. It says you can often, if not always, expect even foreigners to have kind of basic decency and gratitude if you inspire it in them, if they have good reason. And if we take these arguments as seriously as the more notorious passages about knowing how to enter into evil, it seems far from clear that Machiavelli is committed to the extreme go-it-alone kind of realism often ascribed to him. That realism stresses the impossibility of trusting anyone over time in politics, if not in private life, so that it's irrational to commit oneself to honesty or justice towards others. Now, Machiavelli does stress that establishing trust takes hard work. It's not natural. It's not, you shouldn't assume that people are good. Of course not. Um, but you do need, and you need exceptional ordering skills. A key element of Machiavellian virtu is the ability to order new relationships. Um, but it's unrealistic to think that you can do without steady support from others. And to get the necessary others on your side and keep them reliably there, you need to act in ways that foster mutual trust over time. So what kinds of policy are most likely to do this? Well, I uh, don't have time to say very much because I took the time limit literally, um, so I cut out a lot of really interesting examples, but um, I'll give, uh, Machiavelli does touch on what I'd call two reality tests that you can apply to different policies he discusses in The Prince. Um, the first I call the maintaining test. Uh, do your policies help you not just to acquire power, but also to keep what you acquire? Uh, he sets this out at the beginning of chapter seven, uh, where he says that some modes are good for acquiring, but terrible for helping you keep what you acquire. Uh, one such most general mode is to rely on the arms of others instead of on your own resources. Uh, another is to buy supporters with money. You can fly to, and he says fly, you can volano, people, princes fly all the time, volano to impressive heights of grandezza and reputation by means of money, uh, relying on others' arms, uh, taking advantage of others' weaknesses, um, because weaknesses are always temporary for Machiavelli. So if you take advantage of, of someone else's weakness at the moment and expect them to always stay that weak, you're not necessarily on strong ground. Uh, you, know, you can go very high using these methods of fortune, but lose what you gained just as quickly. Um, and the other reality test, apologies to my friend John, uh, is the legacy test. Um, if an individual leader or city or state comes to and maintains great power by deceiving or taking advantage of others' weaknesses, money, but also erodes his country's capacities to uh, preserve itself in the long run, does he deserve highest praise or glory in the truest sense of the word Gloria? Um, I'll leave out the case of Agathocles uh, and go to the case of Rome in The Prince, which is a tricky case, and probably a lot of people will disagree with my take on it. But it seems to me that Machiavelli uses the example of Rome in chapter three, chapters three through five, um, and then further on in The Prince, uh, as a, a, an example that makes you question whether the legacy of Roman methods of conquest um, is actually good for Rome, or did Rome's ways of gaining great power quickly um, ultimately undermine Rome's own uh, internal and external strength um, in the proper sense of the word strong. Um, in chapter three, the Romans make dazzling advances by preemptively attacking and conquering afterwards uh, Greece and Carthage. They're invited, of course, at first they come into these provinces um, at the request of, uh, or at least in the case of Greece, at the request of some people inside, um, and then they eventually take uh, advantage of the weaknesses of the provinces to, um, to assert fuller control over them. Um, if you read chapter three straight, you think it's a straightforward praise of Roman, Romans' clever methods of taking advantage of weak provinces, weak neighbors that they were asked to help out. Um, but by chapters four and five, we start to realize that rebellions and other difficulties, like where difficulties comes up over and over again in those chapters, are actually proliferating. Rome hasn't just suddenly become powerful and that's the end of the story and it's all up, onward and upward. The Romans, once they've conquered these provinces, are facing constant rebellions and um, all sorts of uh, awkward situations which they didn't actually foresee. Ferocious resistance 
from conquered peoples, leaves Romans little choice but to eliminate every last pretense of Greek freedom. Even though Machiavelli says that the Romans wanted to leave the Greeks uh, their own laws while still controlling them, but because the Greeks rebelled so ferociously, they were forced, a necessity arose that, that for them to actually eliminate their freedom and crush Corinth and um, other uh, aspects of Greek um, freedom. So the necessity to do that is something self-inflicted <laughs> by the Romans' policy, not something that they anticipated at the beginning. Machiavelli also says that the Romans were not necessitated at the time to go and invade these provinces. He actually says quite explicitly, there was no pressing necessity at the time for them to, um, to try to conquer Greece or uh, Carthage or Spain. Um, now, back at home, um, having conquered all these places, the Romans start tearing each other apart as their own leaders fight for the spoils of conquest. Machiavelli hints at this in chapter four. He makes a mention of the leaders, if the leaders fighting among themselves for the, the spoils. Very subtle little nuance, easy to overlook, but he's letting you know something that most of the, many of his humanist readers, uh, or readers of at his time, would have known this from their own reading of Roman histories. And quite soon, the Romans wind up under emperors and a military yoke, um, as we read in chapter 19. So in short, Machiavelli's Romans, like Livy's, crush all possible challengers at the price of committing political and moral suicide at home. Okay. Machiavelli doesn't spell this out, he doesn't spell out this judgment, but his words of seeming praise for Rome's prudence ought to be set against his quietly damning descriptions of their eventual results. Um, makes you think, uh, as Yanis' uh, paper yesterday, I appreciated his argument that uh, Machiavelli's examples are often, they make you think more than we often recognize. You, you look for the one clear line of judgment um, and, and the closer you look, the harder it is to find it. So I guess what I'm appealing for here is, uh, um, is, is a recognition, a more open recognition of the ambiguities in Machiavelli's prints and other texts as a starting point for discussing him rather than immediately citing for one line that will, um, um, that will persuade all readers because these ambigu ambiguities make it really hard to persuade everybody. So to end, um, my, my, what I'm proposing here, I guess, in answering the question, is Machiavelli a moralist or a realist, is, well, his text, I think, the text of the prince oscillates between two kinds of realism, and he presents both and makes cases for both. Uh, first realism I would call go-it-alone unilateralism, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but unilateralism based on general mistrust, uh, including doubts about one's own powers to order human relations for better trust. And the second realism I would call collaborative, although that sounds a little bit softer than um, I, I like. Uh, this realism, I think, doesn't conflict with conventional ancient moral restraints. Um, on the contrary, it recognizes that self-preservation depends on keeping faith and respecting other people's natural and reasonable desires not to be forced and for fair, transparent dealing. Now, what I would suggest, and I've, I've, I've just finished a book on that deals with a lot of, well, it deals with the whole prince chapter by chapter, coming out in two months. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I have a lot more to say about this that I'll leave out of the paper. But my, my position there and here is not that the prince is clearly, unambiguously defending the collaborative form of realism, not at all. There's nothing clear about it, um, but that he's presenting us at least two different takes on what is the most realistic way to gain the kinds of power, security, and greatness that you can rely on um, for a long time. And I think the great genius of the prince is that throughout the work, Machiavelli, I think by design, sustains this ambiguity as to which kind of realism is best. Um, and he leaves it to readers to think for themselves on the basis of what he's giving you and on the basis of the histories they, they know from their own countries and about Rome. Uh, which they think is more likely to provide security. Um, I think the prince speaks in two voices, um, the voice of the first kind of realism, go it alone, which is a lot louder, more dramatic, grabs your attention. Sometimes I think takes you in sooner than you should be taken in. 
and the other voice that's very sotto voce, often, you know, sometimes just woven in in tiny little touches, but still actually gives you some very strong arguments. And I would say the arguments that actually support better Machiavelli's fundamental practical proposal in The Prince, which is how to build a civic militia that is the foundation of a strong state. So although he's giving you this, these two different kinds of realism and sustaining an ambiguity, I am suggesting that he's dropping hints of all kinds to push you <laughs> in the direction of the, the more collaborative realism as the more reasonable version. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, now we turn to Michelle Clark, representing the Dartmouth Indians. Oh, that, <laughs> that's a very controversial. We're, we're the big greens now, Professor Mansfield. I hadn't heard that. Why yeah. ever would they do that? There's the moderate party on campus. The moderate party on campus has designated Keggy the Keg as our, <laughs> as our mascot. So there are really three to choose from. Well, I made my choice. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, Professor Mansfield, for inviting me. I appreciate it. The papers have been incredible and illuminating, and I'm looking forward to hearing all kinds of wisdom come my way when I'm done talking. Um, uh, so yes, yes, Machiavelli is the realist. He everywhere openly describes himself as being. Uh, so instead of torturing this poor little book to show that, in fact, it has no secrets to reveal, at least in this regard, I'd like to say a few things about his realism as I understand it. And in particular, I'd like to suggest that the prince, and this is beautifully, been, been teed up beautifully by Erica here, uh, the prince offers us a partial or incomplete picture of his realism. Meaning that while we're surely on solid ground in taking the prince to be a book that offers political readers advice concerning what they should do if they want to avoid being ruined, and does so without consideration for what they ought to do if they want to be good men. It would nevertheless be a mistake to believe it is all the advice that Machiavelli is in a position to give on that subject. In fact, there are other styles of princely virtue that Machiavelli elsewhere acknowledges and explores at great length, most notably in the Florentine histories, which is, among other things, a brilliant study of how the Medici family came to be the undisputed princes of that city. What they accomplished was impressive by any reasonable measure and by Machiavelli's own lights. And yet not a single member of the Medici family, not even Cosimo, the great founder of its princely state, makes an appearance anywhere in the prince. This is a remarkable omission and it deserves comment, even leaving aside the further observation that their example puts pressure on some of the prince's most famous teachings. Nevertheless, this further observation is the subject of my talk, and I'd like to show you briefly um, where I think this pressure is most acute. Now, if there's one lesson that Machiavelli wants to teach readers of the prince, it's that princes and especially new princes, must be armed. So this is the governing idea of the first half of the book, and especially chapters 6, 7, 10, 12, 13, and 14. It finds sharpest expression in chapter 6, where Machiavelli holds that a new prince must be prepared to use force to protect his state against everyone he's despoiled in coming to power. The language here is unequivocal. Arms are not just useful in creating and maintaining a new state. They are indispensable. These innovators, or those innovators who must beg others to carry out their deeds, have always come to ill and never accomplished anything, he writes. Whereas those who stand by themselves and can use force, the go it alone, princes, can use force to impose their will in the face of opposition, are rarely in peril. Put simply and very memorably, all the armed prophets conquered, and all the unarmed pro prophets were ruined. These are some pretty big claims, and I don't need to tell this crowd <laughs> that the historical evidence he adduces to support them is rather thin and selective. 
His examples of prophets who conquered thanks to arms are Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus, four semi-mythical figures, men whose lives are somewhere between the poles of truth and imagination referred to in chapter 15. And Savonarola is the only example he cites of a prophet who was ruined because he could not or would not use arms. He's doing quite a lot of work in that chapter. Nevertheless, it's this rule that underwrites the next several chapters that follow, which all culminate in his pronouncement in chapter 14 that princes devote themselves entirely to the study of military affairs and until they become professional in the art of war. Again, the language here is unequivocal. I'm quoting at length. Thus, a prince should have no other object, nor any other thought, nor take anything else as his art but that of war and its orders and discipline. For that is the only art which is of concern to one who commands. And it is of such virtue that not only does it maintain those who have been born princes, but many times it enables men of private fortune to rise to that rank. And on the contrary, one sees that when princes have thought more of amenities than of arms, they have lost their states. And the first cause that makes you lose it is the neglect of that art. And the cause that enables you to acquire it is to be a professional in this art. No two ways about this. He's not, he's not setting out any middle ground for you to occupy on this question. Now, Mike Valley's great exemplar of princely virtue in chapter 14 is Francesco Sforza, the mercenary captain who rose to become Duke of Milan in 1450. Francesco is one of the real stars of the prince, underappreciated. He appears in five of its 26 chapters, the same frequency as Alexander the Great and Alexander VI, and just behind Cesare Borgia, who gets six. He's also pretty remarkably the only modern prince, I, I think, in the entire book credited with having acquired his principality using virtue. Right? Machiavelli contrasts him favorably with the more well-known Cesare Borgia in chapter seven on exactly this point, asserting that Francesco became Duke of Milan from a private individual by proper means and with a great virtue of his own. And that which he acquired with a thousand pains, he maintained with little trouble. And this is language that harkens back directly to chapter six. On the other hand, Cesare Borgia acquired his state through the fortune of his father and lost it through the same. All we remember from that passage is what it says about Cesare Borgia, which is bizarre, I think. But um, there we are. In any case, there's not much detail here about what Francesco's great virtue actually was, but chapter 14 spells out what any of Machiavelli's contemporaries would have known, that he was a military man who possessed in great abundance martial virtue. Francesco Sforza, quoting, because he was armed, became Duke of Milan from a private individual. Now, Francesco Sforza's rise to power is without doubt one of the great exploits of the 15th century, 15th century Italian history. He was one of seven illegitimate children born to a man named Muzio, an accomplished condottiere in his own right, who had been given the name Sforza, meaning literally force, by one of his employers because he had a reputation for going all in during battle and for being especially pushy in claiming his share of the booty afterwards. <laughs> like his father, Francesco bounced from city to city, fighting on all sides of the endless wars, then being fought among Italy's major powers. Milan, Naples, Venice, Rome, and Florence were all at some point his paymasters. When his most general, generous employer and his father-in-law, Filippo Maria Visconti died, in 1447, without a male heir, Francesco claimed the title of duke for himself. The people of Milan had other ideas, having just established an altogether new regime, deliciously known as the Ambrosian Republic. So, true to his name, Francesco forced himself on the city by encircling it with his troops and slowly starving it into submission. This is all very exciting stuff. But there are two main problems with Machiavelli's treatment of Sforza in The Prince as I see it. 
I'm going to move through them quickly. First, Francesco needed more than just arms to acquire Milan. He also needed money, and he needed a lot of it because sieges are expensive. You need to keep thousands of soldiers fed, clothed, armed, and sheltered for months at a time, in this case, nine months. And Francesco, because these were mercenary troops, also had to pay them wages. Without money, Francesco's arms would have been worthless, and he could not have even attempted his takeover. Now, luckily for him, Francesco found someone willing to give, willing to give, just, that's a, ref, uh, important, willing to give him that money, wasn't forced to, willing, and his coup was, fi coup was financed by the wealthiest man in Europe, Cosmo Medici. This is a rather obscure fact to us, but it was common knowledge in Machiavelli's time. Certainly, we know that Machiavelli himself was aware of Francesco's dependence on Cosmo, because this is exactly the story he tells about Swartz's rise to power in the Florentine histories. This is what he says. When Count Francesco was left alone and had no recourse anywhere, suddenly being alone doesn't sound quite so appealing. <laughs> He was left alone and had no recourse anywhere, it became necessary for him to request aid urgently from the Florentines, both publicly from the state and privately from friends, especially from Cosmo Medici, with whom he had always maintained a constant friendship and by whom he had always been faithfully counseled and handsomely assisted in every enterprise. Nor in this great necessity did Cosmo abandon him? He was very reliable, trustworthy, kind, generous. Right. But as a private citizen, he helped him abundantly and encouraged him to pursue his enterprise. I thought only unarmed princes had to go begging for help. <laughs> so the problem here, as I see it, is that one of Machiavelli's real models of princely virtue in the prince turns out to lack some of the most important qualities he's supposed to have. Instead of standing as an alternative to Cesare Borgia, who, who relied on fortune for his success, Francesco turns out to be another version of Cesare Borgia. <laughs> Just as Cesare depended on his padre, Francesco depended on a padrino. <laughs> and in fact, it may be that the only difference between Francesco and Cesare, if we were to survey their entire political careers, is that Francesco was just in the end luckier than Cesare was. His fatherly benefactor stuck around quite a bit longer than Alexander VI did. So, I mean, Cosmo and Francesco were uh, steadfast allies um, for the rest of their lives. This is quite a turnaround, you know, Florence, historic ally of Milan. We'll talk about that, but. Uh, so the second problem with Machiavelli's treatment of Sforza with which is supposed to illustrate that arms are necessary and sufficient for acquiring principalities, is that it inevitably points beyond itself to a counterexample. And the counterexample is, of course, Cosmo Medici, who had already made himself a prince when he turned his attention to making Francesco I too. He's a counterexample because he did it, he acquired his principality, and he kept it for 30 years without using arms. Remember chapter six. So the Medici, of course, were bankers. They were not soldiers. We have no evidence that Cosmo ever held a sword, let alone used one to cut down his political opponents or lead his city into battle. If anything, Machiavelli's account of Cosmo's rise to power in the history stresses his aversion to the use of force, contrasting him, for example, with political rivals like Rinaldo Albizzi in these terms. And yet the Medici were immensely successful princes. I know I'm gonna get all kinds of flack for saying this, but they were. <laughs> despite what Machiavelli's pronounces in The Prince would lead us to expect. So Francesco had made himself prince of a city that Machiavelli says in the discourses could only ever have been a principality. Maybe not the greatest achievement, right? He says this in Discourses 155. Cosmo made himself prince of a city that was certainly burdened by its own problems, but had only just recently, as a republic, obliterated an entire social order, the magnates, as punishment for their tyrannical instincts. 
Cosmo also ruled Florence for twice as long as Francesco ruled Milan, although that fact may just be governed by circumstances. I'll put it before you to consider. The regime he established proved to be, and I'm thinking maybe here of your tests, the, what were they called, the maintaining test and the legacy test. Mm -hmm. The regime he established proved to be far more durable than Francesco's. Mm -hmm. His principality was passed down through his family for 70 years, even surviving ineptitude along the way, the ineptitude of a couple Pieros. By contrast, Francesco's own son was assassinated. His grandson saw his power usurped by his uncle, who was then thrown out of the city by Louis XII. And after returned, the next year he was thrown out again, and he died in a French prison. His first son was also deposed by a French king after only three years. And the Swartz of family gave up the ghost entirely when Ludovico's other son died childless. Now, it's true the Medici were exiled in 1494 and 1527. But having weathered these few years of turbulence, and they were turbulent years for many cities, they went on to rule Florence for another 200 years. They acquired the papacy three times. They married into all the major royal houses of Europe. In eschewing the use of arms, Cosmo's following the example of his father, Giovanni. The Medici had once been only too willing to take up arms on behalf of their princely ambitions. But they had been punished severely for it. In the 14th century, entire lines of their family had seen their property confiscated, the right to hold public office revoked, and had been sent into exile. Giovanni, however, took a different route. He focused his attention on making money. And even more importantly, cultivating a reputation for being a good man, someone who respected the laws and who could be relied upon to help his fellow citizens in times of need. He was a man of many virtues, all of them conventional. He was generous, kind, helpful, prudent, honest, and trustworthy. When he died, he instructed his son, Cosimo, who had shown himself up until that point to be a rather fierce young man, frustrated by his father's slow slowness and coldness in moving against his enemies, he instructed his son to follow in his footsteps by concentrating on giving and receiving in turn, not taking. Since, and this is a quote, since it is what a man takes for himself, not what is given to him that makes us hate him. And always you will, and always you, and you will always have more than they who in wanting others share, lose their own and before losing it live in continual unease. And this is a nice summary of what Cosmo, in fact, did. Instead of taking power or forcing himself on the city, as Francesco did, he, in a sense, earned it by doing favors, giving benefits to the people, making them his partisans. And once that was accomplished, he didn't need to radically alter the city's Republican orders. He just needed to trust in the loyalty of his friends. So returning our attention now to the prince, I think there's a real puzzle here. Why is the prince so devoted obsessively in its early and middle chapters to making it seem as though arms are the only, only way that princely types can reliably advance their political ambitions? Why doesn't this little book have anything to say about this other different princely style or why what the things he does say in there are so um, quietly inserted and unnamed? <laughs> compared to the more brashly stated and named, attached to Francesco and others, um, pieces of advice concerning arms. So, and why is Cosimo, in particular, just deliberately scrubbed from this book and scrubbed from history, so far as we can tell, right? Despite the fact that as a Florentine prince, he's actually a more relevant example to the book's dedicatee than Francesco is. I can't imagine that Machiavelli ran, just ran out of space. So to be clear, I don't think this is a puzzle that throws into doubt the realism of the prince, if what we take that to mean is a kind of a moralism. In other words, I don't think he ignores the Medici because he thinks Francesco's policy of starving the Milanese people is morally superior to Cosmo's policy of giving them loans, although I'm prepared to be corrected on that. Um, so it, it's, a <laughs> it's a presentation prompted by a question that leaves you with a question, the question is, is that. 
Um, it's a question about Machiavelli's studied forgetfulness in The Prince, about the lessons that were taught by his own city. Um, and I'm interested in hearing the answers that anyone here has to give. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I was writing down your phrase, studied forgetfulness. <laughs> uh, no. And that speaker is uh, Clifford Arwen. What is the mascot of uh, Tor University of Toronto? Uh, we have no shape, only a color. <laughs> with the, vars the varsity blues. Ah. Blues, greens, and crimsons. <laughs> okay. Rainbow Maybe Alliance. Flag? No, it's not mm -hmm. flag. And we have no mascot because a mascot presupposes fans, and we have no fans. <laughs> <laughs> one doesn't expect to come to Harvard and find oneself on a panel with two glamorous Yaleys. <laughs> I, I want to congratulate my, my co-panelists. They haven't rubbed it in by swathing themselves in, in Yale blue. In fact, each of them actually displays overtones of crimson. But, but they, are, they admit that je ne sais quoi that attests to long years of residence in New Haven. Yeah, but, but your, your tie outdoes, outdoes it all. <laughs> um, so oh, although man. my presence on this panel is certainly an unexpected pleasure, um, I probably shouldn't thank uh, Harvey Mansfield for inviting me to this conference uh, since I'm the outlier in the group, the only one who's not a true expert on Machiavelli. I published an article on The Prince early in my career, but since I've gone in other directions, occupying myself primarily with Thucydides, Rousseau, and most recently the Hebrew Bible and Herodotus. The one thing I have going for me is vast experience of teaching the prince, albeit at the int introductory level. That I've done about 35 times now wow. um, at Toronto, <laughs> Harvard, and Chicago. I'm currently in the midst of six two-hour lectures on the prince before an audience of 519 year olds, few of whom given their tender age are patres, but very many of whom are conscripti. <laughs> and uh, yes, 500 of them. Um, everything at Toronto is bigger and better than at Harvard, <laughs> and most notably class sizes. So it made sense to place me on a panel devoted to a question that one must raise even in presenting Machiavelli to beginners. So was Machiavelli a moralist, a realist? Each of these three terms, Machiavelli, moralist, and realist, might brook much discussion, why I could devote fully five of my allotted 15 minutes to each without running out of things to say. Was Machiavelli a realist? Well, Bacon thought so, speaking for all modern writers to follow in declaring himself beholden to Machiavelli for, quote, writing what men do rather than what they ought to do, unquote. And that's what we mean by realism, isn't it? Taking people down a peg by shredding their claims to be better than they are and taking politics down a peg by exploding its worldly or otherworldly pretensions. Machiavelli's realism, so understood, thus culminates in his rejection of imaginary principalities. The loftiest of these, and the one that had done the most harm, was the contemplative life, as variously understood by the classical and Christian traditions. For ancient philosophy, the political life was inferior to the theoretical one, for Christianity, the temporal was inferior to the spiritual. Thus, at both schools, exalted man as he should have been at the expense of politics as it was and had to be practiced. This had corrupted the practice of politics, which it fell to Machiavelli to rehabilitate. We must therefore amend Bacon's characterization as follows. Machiavelli doesn't just depict men as they are rather than as they ought to be. He teaches them that they ought to be as they are or rather as they might have been had they not been taught a morality rooted in the imaginary. Machiavelli initiates modern realism, not least in that his realism is prescriptive as well as descriptive. For centuries prior to Machiavelli, what I'm about to say applies no less to the high Middle Ages so-called than it does to the Renaissance, the leading thinkers of the Christian West had coped with an embarrassment of riches. Humanism preached the dignity of man, which recalled the noble self-sufficiency taught by the classical tradition. At the same time, it deferred to the core Christian teachings of otherworldliness and therefore humility. This synthesis of ima imaginary principalities may have inspired great art, art than which none has ever been greater in my opinion, not even the classical models on which it relied, but it made for bad thought. Machiavelli never deigns to mention a single humanist thinker and worse politics. 
So we may also understand Machiavelli's realism as the obverse of his rejection of this humanism. He nowhere makes this clearer than in chapter 18 of The Prince. Here Chiron, the beast man, replaces Christ, the God man, as the authoritative teacher, and not the Chiron of the humanist Natale Conti, for whom he as the centaur represented the triumph of the humane over the bestial, which is to say of reason over the passions. No, for Machiavelli, Chiron is the appropriate teacher because he rehabilitates the bestial. Part man, part beast proves just a station on the way to part lion, part fox, which is to say all beast. From this perspective then, again, the ultimate imaginary principality was the contemplative life, the teaching of the superiority of the life of reason to that of the passions. For man, as Machiavelli presents him, reason is merely his most powerful weapon in the endless struggle for survival that he shares with every other beast. Machiavelli's new notion of reason thus foreshadows both Rousseau's reinterpretation of reason as perfectibility or adaptability and Darwin's teaching of the survival of the fittest. This demotion of reason from the status of end to that of means is yet another way of stating Machiavelli's realism. Does Machiavelli's realism preclude our deeming him a moralist? Certainly I've said enough to indicate the tension between realism and moralism where the sharp edge of realism is debunking. By moralism in the strict, which is to say modern sense, we must mean deontology, which is the very opposite of debunking. I don't think I've uttered that $10 word in the past 20 years, <laughs> but then I so rarely teach Kant. The strict priority of duty to happiness is hardly a teaching we associate with Machiavelli. True, there are those who think that the bottom line in The Prince is its concluding appeal to liberate Italy from the barbarians. If we too held the duty to the fatherland trumped everything else in Machiavelli, a moralist he would be. But we, or at least I, don't think that. We think that in Machiavelli's hands, the liberation of Italy is just a politically useful euphemism for its conquest by a prince who knows how to make the most of the accident that he's Italian. So understood, patriotism or nationalism is not a duty, but a cloak or ruse. It is the first modern ideology, the this worldly faith, the purpose of which is to rout that other worldly faith, and which to that end must co-opt crucial elements of it. But to say that the people must be taught devotion to the prince, and therefore to conceive the prince as devoted to them, will not suffice to qualify either that prince or Machiavelli himself as a moralist. It rather confirms, confirms him as a teacher of deception, and therefore of evil. If by moralist we mean no more than a critic of the prevailing morality, who is not above invoking moral indignation as one rhetorical means of assailing it, then Machiavelli is a moralist. The question, of course, is how seriously we can take such invocations. That is, whether the world as Machiavelli presents it will sustain them. I'm convinced that in the world as Thucydides presents it um, is not such as to support indignation, a case I've made in my book. Mustn't we infer the same of Machiavelli? I mean, here I'm, I'm was drawn to, to quote exactly the same passage of chapter 17 that, that Erica Benner did earlier. Uh, consider this statement. For one can say this generally of men, that they are ungrateful, fickle, pretenders and dissemblers, evaders of danger, eager for gain. And a little further on in chapter 18, quote, and men are so simple and so obedient to present necessities that he who deceives will always find someone who will let himself be deceived, unquote. People are so unreliable for the same reason that they are so easily deceived and so easily controlled or made reliable, because they are so weak and therefore so greedy, foolish, and desperate. Always looking elsewhere for the safety and comfort they are incapable of providing for themselves. How could we be angry with such beings any more than we could take them seriously in any other respect? The human comedy may be black, but it is no less comedy for that. If the moralist sees fit to hold men to some lofty standard of performance and then to blame them for failing to achieve it, what can we say of him but that he is part of the comedy? Of course, we also encounter quite a different human type in Machiavelli, one who stands out from the crowd in his praiseworthy self-reliance. Yet this is not a superiority gratifying to the moralist or susceptible of moralization. The great are not great by virtue of their freely willed moral goodness. Their virtue is neither freely willed nor is it moral. 
and therefore cannot serve as edifying examples for commending such goodness to the rest of us. I say then, clambering onto my platform erected on the bedrock of 35 consecutive superficial readings, <laughs> that Machiavelli divides humankind into the few who grasp the demands of necessity <coughs> and the many who are deluded <coughs> concerning them. Such a division would leave no place for moral judgment. Machiavelli would to this extent, and it's a very important extent, one has to say, have allied himself with Plato against Kant. Virtu is knowledge, or at any rate, a blend of knowledge and other qualities not susceptible to moral critique. While we might admire or despise someone for what he or she is, as evinced above all by what he or she does, we could not ab apportion moral blame, or for that matter, moral praise, for his or her having done those things. Men are what they are and will do what they do, or what their rulers, whether earth earthly or ghostly, manipulate them into doing. Wherever you look, you will find no grounds for moral denunciation. Yet it would be utopian, to say the least, to expect any, any but a handful of human beings, of Machiavelli's readers, to come to see the world as he does, Sina Ira et Studio. True Machiavelli criticizes Giovan Pagolo Baglioni only for failing to show how little esteem was due those who lived as the Pope and Cardinals did. Still, he could reasonably expect his own expose of that same way of life uh, to rouse Christian peoples to anger. And surely it would be this anger, far more surely than the mere contempt that he blames Giovan Pagolo for repressing, that would promise the sanguinary outcome from which he blames Giovan Pagolo for shrinking. A sincere Christian of Machiavelli's day could sincerely blame hypocrisy as a moral vice. Since man, though sinful, possessed free will, he was capable of abjuring hypocrisy, as he was the other vices. While Machiavelli is surely not above appealing to rags and tatters of such moralism, the evidence for his rejection of it is persuasive. But might we not still view him as the founder of a moralism of a new sort? which combines a critique of Christianity resting on psychological realism with a moral animus against it that such realism seems, in, seems incapable of sustaining, which by offering a reductionist critique of Christianity mobilizes the old age Christian indignation against worldliness and hypocrisy as a force against Christianity itself. Isn't Machiavelli, if not the father, then at least the grandfather of the radical enlightenment and its slogan, écraser l'infâme. I've often thought Marxism the perfect modern ideology, not least in blending the appearance of relentless realism, scientific socialism, or dialectical materialism with an only too murderous moralism. No, the bourgeois is not to be blamed, being a creature of historical necessity, and yes, he is to be hated and punished. Has not modernity as a political movement, and so not just Marxism, relied only too often on just this intoxicating, if seemingly incoherent, blend of realism and moralism. Whether or not Machiavelli shared this distinctively modern fervor, he certainly anticipated it. Lastly, we, we should note the link between Machiavelli and a different strain of modern moralism. Machiavelli implies Kant. To show men as they are rather than as they ought to be is to approach them anti-teleologically, that is, to deny that the human actuality known to us implies a higher potentiality. It is therefore to sever irrevocably the is from any possible ought. I mean, one, one, one possible formulation that occurred to me is that Machiavelli greatly expands our notion of the goodness of human nature, um, but very much at the expense of our notion of the shouldness of human nature, you know, which, which disappears entirely. Once Machiavelli's realism has been, had been systematized as early modern empiricist psychology, there was only one direction left for morality to take. This was something which I think Harvey Mansfield alluded in his presentation, and Rousseau and Kant discerned it. Their moralism shined all the more alluringly alongside the Machiavellian realism that was its partner and foil. My apologies if my talk contained nothing that would have sailed over the head of a 19-year-old. 
But if you fear that it did, do warn me, as this delightful interlude once passed, to them I must return. They are the constituency to whom in the last analysis I must answer, and therefore I don't want to confuse them. Thank you. <laughs> well, we share the, the need to address the vulgar ourselves. <laughs> so um, <coughs> questions or comment? Thanks. Uh, I have a question for Michelle, uh, or it's almost a, a comment, I guess. Uh, thinking about Francesco Sforza and Cosimo de' Medici, uh, it occurred to me uh, that the Medici are mentioned twice in the text of the prince. The, uh, there's Leo X. Uh, in chapter 11, and then in, the, in chapter 26, there's the discussion of your house, which would be the house of the Medici, you know? Um, but, uh, but no Cosimo, absolutely no Cosimo. And why? Uh, and that uh, brought to mind Paul's discussion of the church. Uh, and remember how in the discourses, chapter one of book three, we have Christianity as uh, a phenomenon that uh, can control large territories without arms, uh, that uh, teaches the people to obey of their own volition, uh, that it's evil to speak, uh, that it's wicked to speak evil of one's rulers, even wicked rulers, um, and that you should leave the punishment of their errors to God. Uh, and it occurred to me that Cosimo, as a banker, uh, is offering another model, which is that of money. And, and, and of, of commerce, uh, which Machiavelli hasn't quite grasped, but I think that that's there uh, in, in his thoughts about Cosimo, let's say. Uh, we, we, we know that some of his uh, relatives uh, actually worked in the Medici Bank. So. Huh. I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. I mean, I wouldn't want to stress, so, Cosmo Medici was a banker. He was the wealthiest man in Europe. His bank was enormously successful. His money was indispensable for doing what he did, for acquiring his state. Um, I don't know if I would want to characterize his relationships as commercial, um, the relationships that were instrumental in uh, helping him to become a prince as being commercial relationships. I mean, there were. it was sort of outside the sphere of commerce that he really um, flourished as a um, as an as, as a princely type as, as a grandi. I mean, he what he did was he loaned money to people and never asked for it back. And as Machiavelli says uh, in the histories, you know, he loaned money to people who didn't ever ask for it, <laughs> who had no need for it. They were surprised to find Cosmo show up at their house with money. And they took it. Um, he was so he was, and he and he did this as an act of friendship, as an act of friendship, as a gesture of goodwill, as an attempt to demonstrate his, um, you know, um, who and what he was, not as a banker, but as a as a neighbor, um, as a local. You know, big guy who you know who could help out if someone you know in the future needed. I mean, to to generate a, a relationship of trust and reciprocity that um, I think is somewhat different than you know com commercial has a harder edge to it. The merc mercenary, you know, his relationship with Francesco maybe was had some mer more of a commercial aspect to it. Although importantly, when Machiavelli describes even that, it was a friendship too. I mean. Francesco looks to him as a friend, and that's really what explains his fidelity to Cosmo going forward, not that Cosmo was paying him money. Being paid money never kept him mercenary around for long, so long as there was more money somewhere else. It was his sense that, that Cosmo was a friend. Nathan. Uh, remarks. One of the passage in chapter 10 that Erica invoked on the uh, m moral, quasi-moral, <laughs> Uh, side that men are more obligated 
by the benefits they give than those they receive, it's a little nastier in context in that the, the example of benefits that men give that obligates them is if the enemy comes and burns uh, your citizens' <laughs> possessions outside the city, <laughs> yes, okay. then they are obligated to you. So the benefit they gave you was to have their <laughs> possessions <laughs> destroyed by the enemy. Mm. So it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, and how that relates to whether you make them strong or weak is at least complicated. They have to be strong enough to have possessions the enemy can burn, <laughs> but, well. And the other thing is just, I'd like to put Francesco Sforza in a somewhat different context in The Prince. It seems to me there's a, a striking series of military commanders who destroy republics. It's pr uh, one could even say it's a theme though not explicitly marked as such uh, through, uh, throughout uh, Caesar, Sforza, Agathocles, Hero, Oliverato da Fermo. And it, there's only one passage, to my knowledge, in The Prince where Machiavelli openly and explicitly addresses republics in chapter 12, where he says uh, uh, princes should go command their own armies, and republics should send their own citizens and check them with laws if they're not good so as, so as to prevent them from becoming princes of the city. It's the one place in the whole book where he <laughs> tells republics how to avoid principalities, and it's precisely uh, addressed against the Sforzas, Caesars, uh, Agathocles, heroes. Caesar is a more complicated case in The Prince because he's both an example of that mm. and a Cosimo-like example of somebody who becomes prince through liberality. In 133 of the discourses, he's actually explicitly paired with Cosimo. So he does both. He has the Sforza arms and the Cosimo liberality, giving loans and presents and all, and you know, becomes the ruler of Rome for hundreds of years from Machiavelli's point of view. I saw, um, yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> um, it is, it is, it is a nasty example, um, and uh, I mean, two, two things to say about that. First, um, I think Machiavelli often, when he's saying something that sounds a little bit softer or more moderate than the overall tone he's <laughs> adopting in a text, <laughs> in an individual discourse or in a whole book, uh, he often kind of counter, he, he'll, he'll shift tones, having, having said things um, that sound a little bit moderate and urging princes to uh, actually treat their plebs um, not as just cannon fodder, <coughs> but as human beings who need, if, if you want to motivate these plebs to be your own arms, you've got to feed them, you've got to make sure they have jobs the whole year round that keep them in, uh, in, in respectful positions where they actually get the respect of their fellow citizens, um, uh, and, and basically raises the whole status. Having said all those soft sounding things, he then wants to kind of say something that sounds a little bit more traditional and hard. And this happens very often, of course, in the prints and the discourses. Um, so then he's, you know, you want them to fight and die for you. But the basic point is still the same. You still, the, the point is, you're appealing to a prince whose interest it is, he thinks, to get these plebs to fight and die for you and to be willing to sacrifice their property as well as their lives. And, um, that, that, that is actually the, the thing he's arguing for. So I don't think the fact that it's kind of unpleasant contradicts the point that the whole argument he's making leading up to that is still, you've got to treat them in ways that inspire mutual reciprocal trust and where what they're able to give you is uh, something that depends on them having considerably more power than they had to begin with. Yes. Of course. <coughs> um, yes, no, from Randy Newell. based on my own vast experience of having taught Thucydides four times in the last 30 years, um, <laughs> I wanted to ask Professor Orwin, because this is a question a 19-year-old student might well ask me, and I'm not sure how I would answer it. Um, Machiavelli and Thucydides are always the two prime candidates for exemplars of realism. So 
I'm just wondering, you know, having thought about both thinkers, how would you start to go about comparing and, and contrasting the realism of Machiavelli and the realism of Thucydides? Well, I make sure that my 19-year-olds know nothing of Thucydides, <laughs> so none will ever have occasion to ask that, that embarrassing question. <laughs> and I really wouldn't, you know, hardly would know where you know, to, to begin answering it. Um, but I guess I would say that, um, in a way, uh, the distinction is sort of expressive, I think, of the difference between classical and modern political thought generally. Um, in that it seems to me that Machiavelli is ultimately much more hopeful than Thucydides about what could be accomplished politically because he thinks of human nature as um, lower and therefore paradoxically as something from which more can be expected, right? Lower and therefore more plastic. And I was actually going to raise this consideration a little later in a, a question that I wanted to put to, to Erica, but you've compelled me to jump the gun. That peoples in Thucydides, for instance, um, seem to be much more unyielding um, than peoples in Machiavelli um, in a way that places much greater limits um, on both the, you know, the, the height um, of what can be accomplished by princes and the durability um, of what can be um, accomplished by them. Um, I would say that the most successfully Machiavellian regime in, um, in, in Thucydides would be the Spartan regime, but it's very striking how that pressure, that pressure which sort of um, forms the crucible um, of, 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 of Sparta and um, a, accounts for the success of the Spartan system, because it is a system more, of course, than it's the action of any individuals in, in shaping good citizens, I mean, ultimately um, depends on the chance, right, of the, of the pressure exerted from beneath by the helots. That's where necessity manifests itself above all in, in the Spartan regime, rather than in any, um, in a way, like Kurgan right, a, a ability of the elites in Sparta, you know, to, you know, to exert the pressure from above that would, that would shape the citizens in the, in, in the desired way. So I guess that's, I mean, that, that would be my, 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 my basic uh, uh, characterization that, that, that Thucydides is less hopeful because for him ultimately um, nature is stronger and laws or modes and orders are, are weaker as, as a perennial fact of human life. And obviously, you know, if Thucydides and Machiavelli were to debate this matter between them, um, Machiavelli would point first at Rome as an example of a regime that achieved far more than Thucydides seems to think any regime can achieve, and then, of course, at Christianity, right, as something which has succeeded in shaping the souls of human beings in a way that, that he would argue you know, Thucydides would have, would, have, would have found unimaginable. Yes. Oh. And I was especially taken with the challenge that Michelle posed to us. And I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, and I was trying to think, what would I think about if I, wanted, if I were trying to grapple with that challenge? Uh, and there's some things that you probably have read or maybe not. Uh, I'd start with The Godfather. Uh, and I'd start with the opening That's sequence of the movie. But I'd look at the book, uh, which it has to do with the acquisition of a client. Um, uh, th there's, there's the man whose daughter has been oh, taken yeah. advantage of, and uh, he wants the boys killed who did it. And he's got to say to the uh, godfather, be my friend, before he'll do it. But he knows that being my friend means that um, he, he will have to do beneficia. Uh, so I, it seems to me to understand the Godfather scene, you have to read Cicero's De Amicitia. <laughs> Cosimo is a man of friendship, right? <laughs> well, read Cicero's De Amicitia, and then there are two scholarly works that look at what Amicitia means in Rome. Uh, there's Ronald Symes' The Roman Revolution, which is about the original Principatus, mm -hmm. the original Princeps, it's the rise of Augustus. And then there, uh, there was a book by a student, uh, his best student, Ernst Badian, called Foreign Clientelae, 
which is about friendship and foreign policy. Uh, now, Machiavelli's obviously not read The Godfather, though the man who wrote The Godfather probably read Machiavelli. Um, uh, and he hasn't read Syme, and he hasn't read Badian, but he's read their sources. Uh, which is to say he has a pretty good idea about how clientship works at Rome. And the interesting thing is he doesn't talk about it. His Rome is a Rome that backs away from clientship. If you can answer that question, why... What do you mean Ro his Rome backs away from clientage? Um, Roman politics is all about acquiring friends. Machiavelli, in talking about Roman politics, doesn't talk about acquiring friends. Well, now, in the he, fl Florentine he does, histories, he, he does. Well, book three, chapter 28, he identifies, well, he calls it partisanship, right? I mean, that's just his language for it. When you're acquiring personal dependence, euphemistic, euphemistically known as friends, um, through the extension of pro personal favors, benefits, advice, gifts, you know, rewards, so forth. Um, when you acquire these dependents who have a special loyalty to you that outranks, outstrips the loyalty they feel to public institutions and laws, your republic's in trouble. And a republic needs to take the prevention of these parties um, as its first order of business. I mean, this is where princes come from this within may, republics. This may be the explanation for why he leaves Cosimo out of the prince. Well, no, I mean, it, if that sounds like a great lesson to teach someone who wants to become a prince, right? I mean, build a party. So if The Prince is a book that is written as an instruction manual for men who want to make themselves princes, and Rome and other republics have sort of foundered on a political culture in which clientage, clientelism is everywhere and has a great deal of, um, normative support in, you know, just as a, as a fact of Roman life, but also it has higher, more intellectual works sort of backing it up to some degree, then, um, yeah, I mean, I think he's alive to that as a problem, and I would, I would expect him to but be writing about it. But your hypothetical is what has to be called into question. But what? Your but hypothetical has to be called into question, if the prince is written as you said. Suppose it's not. Okay, so what is it written for, then? Perhaps affecting a transformation of politics away from what really went on at Rome. I, so, I mean, I do have a hunch about what he's doing here. I just, I'm not trying to be coy. I'm trying to stay within my 15 minutes. I agree with you. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think though, the book can still be a work of political realism insofar as it's attempting to instruct princes about how it is that princes become <laughs> successfully princes and hold their states, right? It can be a book that in good faith does that, but um, mm -hmm. does it in the service of an even higher objective. So it's, it's telling a very stylized story about how princes, but one, one that's reliable enough that if a prince were to follow it, he'd probably do fine. But he's, he's selecting out for a princely readership one style of princely virtue because ultimately it's more conducive to the foundation of a Republican state that has some hope of surviving. So following in Cesare Borgia's footsteps is never gonna move Italy beyond the, you know, the state of vileness that it, it currently is. Um, Ross. Chinese tradition, Chinese realists, uh, who always fought against uh, Confucianists, they started with a, a bleak view of human nature, which is uh, parallel to what you've been saying. And the Confucianists had an optimistic one. But their stress was not on psychology or trust or anything like that, but pretty much on administration. Han Feidze, for instance, who advised emperors more than 2,000 years ago, he said it's a, re a realism of administrative results. He said uh, a weak state will have uh, eight rewards 
and a list of only three punishments. A strong state will have uh, eight punishments and just a list of three rewards. This is how you get uh, results. Does that align at all with anything in Machiavelli? Well, maybe fear over love. But the um, realism of uh, Machiavelli is uh, to think that punishment is more effective than uh, giving benefits. How would you? Well, this word realism <laughs> is so plastic that, I mean, there's the realism of looking to uh, fact, <laughs> to history, as opposed to our imagination of it. And, you know, his it may not be a realist text by my reading along those lines, but it's realism eventuates in certain definite prescriptions of that sort. But mm. Maybe I'll have, a, I'll have a little go at it, because it, it set yes, off it some, some thoughts about some things he says in The Prince. And again, I mean, my view is he actually says a little bit about the benefits of both rewards and punishments. Overtly, he seems to say that, uh, I, I mean, in Chapter 17 in particular, which is on cruelty <laughs> um, and mercy, or, or pietas, uh, the emphasis is very much on the need for a strong state to have um, you know, very severe punishments for serious crimes. And he criticizes, um, for example, the Florentines for not being strict enough with one of their subject cities, Pistoia, um, where you know, there were some sort of infamously murderous factions that the Florentines were too merciful about <laughs> managing. And if only they'd been very, very severe and punished the leaders of these um, factions earlier, they could have put a stop to some of this. So I think um, in that sense, you know, in that chapter, what you get is the sense that the, the moral position Machiavelli wants to criticize is the kind of Christian moralism that says, oh, let's be merciful to criminals of all sorts. Machiavelli wants to counterbalance that by saying, no, punishments need to be extremely harsh when the crime is serious. Is that a radical new position? That's why I disagree with a lot of people. That is a very classical Roman position. Um, you find it in Sallust. You find it in Seneca. Seneca actually um, says that uh, there is um, what many people regard as uh, a virtue, misericordia, pity, which is actually vicious um, in many cases because people become too soft in dealing with punishments that really need to be dealt with very severely. Um, and I think Machiavelli can be read in that chapter as kind of trying to revive an ancient Roman conception of severe virtue rather than advocating um, a kind of cruelty that goes you know, far beyond that. Um, and, and just on the other side, he says very little in The Prince about rewards, but he's got that little funny passage mm -hmm. which echoes very much um, Xenophon's hero um, about princes um, ought to try, a good prince ought to try not to be the one who administers punishments because punishments make you hated and it's not good to be hated. Um, so a prince should set it up so other people do the punishing and he says, in a legitimate court, <laughs> however, um, and uh, they should make themselves the administrators of rewards because rewards make you loved. So that's my so <laughs> off if the I could just response. interject <laughs> just quickly. I mean, <clears throat> I don't think you can read that chapter on mercy and cruelty as a defense of a Roman idea of virtue because it's true that Romans identified severitas as a virtue, but <laughs> Machiavelli's not talking about severitas. He's talking about cruelty. <laughs> but is he? <laughs> but is he? I mean, that's and that's again well, a question. Of I think so. He, no, he, he uses is. he uses the word. <laughs> yes, he uses the word. Crudelita and he and he and crudelta. Um, but what he does in the chapter, I think, uh, is this in, in a similar way that he does in the previous chapter on liberality, he converts what is commonly called mm -hmm. the vice of cruelty. He says, people, everyone thinks that cruelty is a vice. Well, what do most people think is cruelty? What most people think is cruelty is being too severe on criminals, being too harsh. Um, well, and Romans would have agreed. I mean, that's the definition. Severitas is an appropriate. No, no. What most people call what most people crime. call cruelty is yeah but, yeah. but people are calling cruel what ought to be called severe. So, 
arguably, um, and I do this at great length in a chapter on my book, but it's very hard to demonstrate otherwise, um, he actually converts his whole definition of cruelty as you go through the chapter, um, let's say just severe cruelty, resemble, suspiciously resembles what the Romans called severitas, more than what these people, these people today, um, are calling cruelty. And remember that in chapter 15, he doesn't say that, uh, uh, you know, his whole starting point is chapter, in chapter 15 is people get the names of vices and virtues wrong. People often, um, you know, accuse somebody of being cruel or uh, um, um, misero, uh, you know, uh, mean, I guess is how, they tra how you translate it, uh, when in fact that thing that's being criticized as a vice, if used properly, produces security and stability in a state. Um, so you can't take the words he uses, I think, too literally in all those chapters, because he's challenging the names of virtues and vices as in, in a Thucydidean fashion, I believe. But that's all. Yeah, um, I guess I, I would say of the Chinese sage that he has it right from Machiavelli's point of view as far as it goes, especially since Machiavelli stresses that it's better to be both feared and loved, right? W which w would point to the necessity of, 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 of benefits as well as punishments. Although, I think one has to say two things, that there is um, ultimately, as he admits, a priority of being feared to being loved, right? That, that, that somehow the, the, the fear is the necessary foundation. And also that he shows an el his elaborate strategy for being both feared and loved, I think, points to a kind of reward or benefit which one might otherwise underestimate, which is the reward or benefit of seeing one's enemies punished. Yeah, that, that, that somehow this is the reward or benefit that delights most people the most, right? So that there's a, a nasty connection between cruelty and, and, even, and, and even benefits there. Yeah, the Yankees. Uh, so, so uh, no, question. Hi, yeah, I, I wanted to disagree with uh, Chris Erica Benner um, on, on this, well, agree and disagree, but I think the, the, the disagree is more fundamental. Um, agreed. Uh, he, Machiavelli would like something more like severity and would be with the Romans, um, the ancient Romans as opposed to the modern Romans on this question and he, uh, his correction would therefore resemble um, the ancient Romans. But a premise of what you were saying um, rather than what you were showing, it seemed to me a premise was that um, severity for him uh, or cruelty for him, you're, you're equating the two, um, assumes that the question is the punishment of crimes, and really bad crimes, those are the ones that have to be severely dealt with. But that, that seems to me to, to miss the, the Machiavellian point um, that uh, it's not about making sure everyone knows that the laws are going to be severely punished, it's the management of the passions of people, um, sometimes with respect to the law, sometimes without any respect for the law, but with respect to the position of the prince, um, managing the passions of those who he wants to stupefy and satisfy in ways that are going to be good for him. Um, that becomes the distinguishing point between cruelty well and ill-used, it seems to me. Um, so so, I, so I, I guess I, I, yeah, I register the disagreement um, more strongly than the agreement. And then I, just a question for Michelle. Um, I know you, you, you know this fact, so I'm just wondering what you do with it in your um, treatment uh, of what you're putting forward as this wonderful, cozy friendship between the, these, these two, um, Swartz and Cosimo, where um, in Machiavelli's presentation in the Florentine Histories, if I'm remembering it correctly, in the end, uh, Cosimo is left pining for the reciprocity. Um, f uh, he's given all this money, all this time, to Sforza, and Sforza leaves him in the lurch in the end. Um, doesn't that show um, that if, for, first of all, yet the system's corrupt, they're both dependent on each other. You want to be neither a mercenary nor um, someone paying mercenaries. You want to have really arms of your own. Um, but if you got to choose, wouldn't you rather be the Sforza and get money somewhere? You go first. <laughs> Uh, so it is true. So um, when when Cosimo dies, Machiavelli says, um, you know, he's uh, he lists a number of very brief 
statements about Cosmo, about his achievements. It's very, it's very um, um, sort of piccato. But then he stops for a second, and he really dwells for a moment on this disappointment that he feels. He dies in a state of anxiety about um, not having, a, I think it's reacquired Luca with uh, Francesco Sforza's help because when he initially, and this isn't all spelled out in the, in the histories, but this is effectively what happened. Um, when he initially loaned him this money, uh, Francesco Sforza reassured him, among other things, that he'd do this for him, and he didn't. Uh, and this, this really distressed Cosmo, apparently. Um, I would say a couple things. One, it's not quite correct to say that um, for that reason we should understand uh, Francesco Sforza to have left him in the lurch, like generally. He f was his ally in an innumerable wars, battle, you know, s s international intrigues. Um, Sforza did a lot for him, but he didn't do this one thing. And it would happen to be one thing that Cosmo really wanted him to do. I would point out that, um, you know, Francesco Sforza just didn't seem very interested in acquiring territories. He didn't acquire any for himself either. Um, his lack of acquisitions didn't seem to distress him. And so maybe this in a way reflects well on, on Cosmo. He had ambitions that went beyond just becoming a prince of this little, little state. But then, sort of more generally, I would just, I would say this. Um, I don't think we should raise the bar for political princely virtue, as Machiavelli understands it, too high, um, such that we need to see a life that lacks disappointment um, entirely to feel satisfied that we've got a real exemplar on our hands. Because if we look at these, um, these founders of chapter six and we think about their own lives, I mean, each of them suffered failure and disappointments. It's serious failure and disappointment. So like Romulus ultimately was killed by his fellow senators. We hold him up as a, as a virtuous prince, but he was assassinated, mm -hmm. um, or taken up in a whirlwind. I forget which, <laughs> which one it was. Um, Theseus was driven out of his city, I think, and went and stayed with the king who threw him off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So he met a pretty bad end. Um, Moses never got to the promised land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and worse yet, God does this great thing. He lets him, he calls him over and shows him the promised land. Says, you're almost there, mm -hmm. but I'm not gonna let you get there. I, you know, he takes his life at that moment, you know, effectively, I mean, it's, it's, if you read it in a Machiavellian sort of way, it sounds sort of homicidal. <laughs> um, and, and Cyrus, you know, out of the bunch, does the best. He dies in battle, um, having a, you know, won a great empire, done everything he seems to have wanted to do in life. But um, you know, his son goes insane, marries two of his sisters, kills one of them, kills his brother, is deposed, you know, kills himself by accident with a sword, mm -hmm. stabs himself with his own sword. So I mean, all these, even even you know, and if and if these figures in chapter six can't even be trusted as virtuous, reliable indicators of what a virtuous, you know, a virtuous prince looks like. Then I don't know where we can get any kind of stability in the book. So, um, so yeah, he didn't get Luca. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get Luca, and he was disappointed by Francesco. So it was an imperfect life, and he was um, betrayed in some sense, some real sense, by that friend. But um, I don't take that to be enough reason to um, expunge him from the record entirely, not least because let's, let's even concede that that was a, a true failure and indicated that Cosmo's um, style was deeply flawed and not to be followed. Well, put it in the book. You know, and put it in the book. I mean, give that example if that's so illustrative. Um, so that, that's anyway mine. Um, I'd like to make a suggestion to each of my fellow panelists. Is that okay? <laughs> um, uh, this question of why the Medici aren't present in the Prince, I must admit I've never thought about that, and obviously it's worth thinking about. But I'd like to make two suggestions. 
The first is, I'm struck by the fact that nobody has yet mentioned the respect in which the Medici and their illustrious history are most present in the prints, mm -hmm. which is precisely in the, um, the styling of the princely Lorenzo as Lorenzo the Magnificent. Mm -hmm. um, in the Epistle Dedicatory, which if you read it ironically, which I think you have to since the Epistle Dedicatory contains no praise of this little Lorenzaccio whatever, mm -hmm. um, points to the unworthiness of Lorenzo as an imitator even of his ancestors, let alone of Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus. So the threadbareness um, of Lorenzo as a repository of, of, of Machiavelli's hopes and the ludicrousness of suggesting that Lorenzo you know, might be the deliverer of, of Italy, I think is enhanced by the fact that it's not even suggest that he could emulate um, his, own, his own worthy ancestors, that there's this crashing silence on that score. But I also think that in as much as Machiavelli does say that that book, like the Discourses, contains everything he knows, mm -hmm. and it, it is addressed in chapter 15, as he says, to those who, who know or understand, and therefore not primarily to Lorenzo, you would have to conclude that somehow one doesn't really need the Medici um, in order to achieve an, an adequate understanding of politics, but maybe that makes sense too, You know that there was nothing so outstanding about the Medici that one absolutely had to had to mention them um, in, a, in, in a work intended to, especially in a brief compass, to convey the, the, the fundamental political teachings to the, to the discerning. Yeah, the Medici are never recommended for imitation, as is Cesare Borgia. How, do you, how would you deal with uh, Borgia, Ooh. that question? Uh, Oh, um, big, big without question. That, without I've gone around to a lot of Machiavelli conferences giving some papers on it, which some people here may have heard. Um, no, but I do, I, uh, the, so if, I should, if I could simplify my um, long take of that long chapter on the long chapter, um, mm -hmm. I think, I think uh, there are two things. First of all, Machiavelli doesn't say every prince should imitate Cesare Borgia. He says every prince who wants to acquire by fortune should imitate Borgia. Not every prince who wants to acquire by virtu should imitate Borgia. So that is a very clear point. Um, and then at the very end of this long narration of Borgia's uh, attempts to make himself, uh, to convert himself from initial reliance on the fortune of his father, Pope Alexander VI, to reliance on his own arms, attempts that Machiavelli seems to praise occasionally, <laughs> but never actually blesses with the word virtu um, until kind of very late in the day and then very reluctantly. At the end of all this, he says, well, he would have succeeded if only uh, the pope that he backed, um, if, he, if he hadn't backed the wrong pope, basically, at the end of the day. Now, he's been telling us all the way through that Cesare Borgia's problem was that he started off relying on somebody else's arms, namely those of his father, the pope. By the end of all this, attempts, uh, Cesare's attempts to make himself independent of any pope he's still relying <laughs> on the next pope. So has he actually achieved the foundations that Machiavelli loudly says he has achieved a few times in the chapter? This is, a, I mean, the, I think this is the kind of thing that happens over and over in The Prince, but that example of Cesare, especially if you pay attention to it, it makes you think, <laughs> it makes you pause and say, he's giving us these loud words of praise about Cesare's foundations, but the story he's actually told about the building of those foundations has been a you know, really not a very happy one, and it hasn't resulted in success. So the usual explanation of Cesare's failure, which is simply, well, he was he had bad luck. He had Fortuna. Fortuna can hurt, bring down even the greatest, most virtuoso statesman, and here's Cesare as an example of that. Um, I, I have problems with that reading because he's actually giving you lots of um, historical evidence of his own type, <laughs> of his own kind, um, that Cesare's attempts to make himself independent were actually not working. Okay, here's another, here's another uh, question for you. Uh, what about conspiracy? The longest chapter in The Prince and the longest chapter in The Discourses are, are both on uh, conspiracy. And the one, the one in The Discourses tells you at some length how actually to do it or to prevent it. I don't know any humanist writer that wrote on conspiracy. <coughs> do you? Not in a nice way, so, <laughs> all right. All right, now one of the difficulties that comes up with conspiracy is, uh, uh, 
Catalinarian conspiracy, and also um, uh, Pontano writes on the conspiracy of the balance barons, uh, but but again in not a nice way, uh, and he perfectly approves the King of Naples Ferdinand's approach, which is to invite all the barons to dinner, uh, and then uh, kill them all and throw them into the moat, which he thinks is a perfectly good solution uh, to the problem, partly because it then empowers all of the all of the humanists in the court of which he has won, and he becomes the prime minister of Naples. Um, I wanted to uh, get in on the conspiracy theme. Um, uh, I, I was really uh, fascinated, Erica, by, by your presentation, and especially uh, <coughs> by uh, the way in which um, you observe the uh, normative ambiguity in, in Machiavelli, and I'm sure that um, your bottom line is more apparent in the book, which I should read, than than in your talk. But it, it seems to me that that one of the most um, you know innovative features uh, in Machiavelli is, in a way, a return to looking at the moral phenomena in light of legality, uh, and uh, that, in consequence, one could say, you know, following Walter Benjamin, that there is law creating and law destroying violence, for example. And it may be that the unilateralism or the appearance of unilateralism is much more connected to what is required to establish legal authority, whereas if you want to, you know, uh, reestablish a new legal authority, then you have to destroy the existing legal authority. Uh, and there's another word for that, which is revolution, which necessarily implies conspiracy and therefore at least uh, the trust among people who are quote unquote uh, uh, friends. So I wonder how you would react to this kind of hypothesis for uh, explaining the subtle way in which M Machiavelli oscillates or moves in between what you call the unilateralist uh, uh, sort of Uppermensch type uh, morality on the one hand and the need for trust and social cooperation on the other? That's an excellent question. It has many, um, you know, sparks of many possible <laughs> um, angles of response. Uh, I guess, the m I mean, uh, before I spell out my bottom line, um, uh, I guess one of the quotes from Machiavelli that sprung to my mind um, in the, when you asked the question, was uh, from the discourses where he says, and Vicky or somebody who knows the discourses better than me can help, but it take, uh, um, for a man to, the, the one where he says a man to become a, to become a um, prince in a republic, one presupposes a bad man. Is that 118? How does it go? Oh, Nathan can help too. <laughs> anyway, no, but you know, uh, yeah, it presupposes a bad man to try to become prince in a republic. Um, uh, and I, I can't remember the rest, and maybe that's... Reordering of a city for a political way of life right. presupposes a good day. Reordering. Becoming prince of a republic by right. violence presupposes a bad day. Right. And that's why one will find it very rarely happens that someone good wishes to become prince by bad ways, even though his end be good, and that someone wicked, having become prince, wishes to work well. Yeah. I mean, that, exactly, thank you. Um, yeah, that last bit raises a lot of questions about the assumption that there's a sharp distinction between Machiavelli's modes for, uh, let's say, founding a new city or reforming completely, overthrowing one that's corrupt, and on the other hand, uh, trying just to kind of set up something that's a little bit better in, in, a, in, in a state. I, I, I mean, I'm not sure there's a, I think at the end of the day, he gets you to think through the modes that are appropriate for both, and I think he thinks the same modes are good for founding and for maintaining, um, and not that they're two different ones. Uh, his basic distinction in the prince in particular, but also the discourses, is relying on the modes of fortune and the modes of virtu, and I think the modes of virtu are always the ones that are most likely to, um, to, to involve stability and order right from the beginning. And so the question of whether Machiavelli is a revolutionary in, in, in cases where he's facing a very corrupt um, state. Does he then approve of kind of violent revolution, eliminating you know, certain groups of people? Uh, that's 
where I would, I, I certainly don't think um, he is one. No, I think he's uh, somebody who actually tries to get, he, he puts a lot of examples out there to get people to think about the, you know, the, the, the attractions of going that route when a state is corrupt, but also lots of warnings about the risks of, uh, of going that way, because once you have a revolution, um, that opens up all sorts of cans of worms that uh, are going to prevent you from establishing order for a very long time. And that's my own view about conspiracies is similar, that, that uh, while well, he, he's, he's, he was dealing with lots of young men when he wrote the discourses and when he wrote The Prince too, who were attracted by the idea of conspiracy. They were very tempted to kind of, you know, the conspiracies were happening all the time. The Medici had just come back. Um, a lot of people didn't like it. And discussions were, shall we conspire or not, um, to try to get rid of them. And Machiavelli's own experience, of course, having been <laughs> under suspicion of being a conspirator, and also his families. He had family members who were, um, got into very serious trouble um, for conspiring against Cosimo de, de Medici. Um, I think actually instilled deep caution in him about conspiracies. And he does warn that if you try to do it alone or with a few people, your chances of succeeding are almost nil. So it's better not to even try. I don't know, that doesn't quite answer your question, but. Why? Mm. later in, in a different time frame than these young men might have been thinking about I'm not sure he thought that much about revolution in the whole sense the way that you know we, we have come to later on but I do think there's some an, a case in the Florentine histories that um, you mentioned actually where you get something that is a coup d'etat but also for a little while seems to have some chances of surviving and that is um, um, the movement against the Duke of Athens, the tyrant Duke of Athens, because unlike cases he gives uh, before and after that of kind of minority conspiracies, a few little elites who go off and plot and say, you know, without knowing what the people are going to, how the people are going to respond, those almost always fail in Machiavelli. But this time they succeeded at least for a tiny bit because the three main groups in the city, he says, actually got together and formed a kind of agreement to all publicly, not conspiratorially, but openly, try to overthrow this tyrant. And it succeeded. And he kind of says, for a little while it was hopeful until, <laughs> as you say, the, the grandee decided to sort of take it over again. And I think, but I think that's more his model of a, of a way to change government and social conditions you know, in, in a way that's not bound to bring more disorder on yourselves. Try to get as many people on board as possible, hopefully do it openly and not uh, surreptitiously because this kind of surreptitious conspiracy almost always means that some people are not gonna like it and they're gonna rebel against you and not trust That's you. That's definitely a conspiracy though, right? Huh? What, that was? When they threw the Duke of Athens at the yeah. little conspiracy? I mean, it was a bigger conspiracy yeah. than usual, but. I mean, but as he said, you mean according to the Florentine history, Duke of Athens didn't know it was coming, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, yes, yeah. Yes, the yeah. so-called Duke of Athens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, uh, uh, here's, a, here's a point that uh, I was going to raise and uh, about conspiracy, and, and that is the difficulty that arises when, um, uh, someone, one of the conspirators suffers from what Machiavelli calls comically confusione di, ce di cervello, <laughs> confusion of the brain. <laughs> and and the, an example that, that he gives is somebody who's willing to murder someone else, but not to do it in a church. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so this, this uh, le leads to, you know, this, the, 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 to the chapter on uh, how, to, how to be altogether bad. Doesn't it suggest that the, that the most trustworthy conspirator, co-conspirator that you can have is another absolute scoundrel like yourself? Yes. And uh, think of what's going on in Breaking Bad, <laughs> our TV show, and how the, you know, Walt and Jess, Jesse, Walt suffers from the, the inhibitions, moral inhibitions of, of Jesse. Yes. Now, how does so do you the, know more all right, about popular so the, culture the, than I do? Yeah. What is going on in this world? Yeah. So the the, the, the better the better the the, the, the 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 more of a scoundrel you are, the more reliable you are. <laughs> I, I've never watched Breaking Bad. I can't, I can't answer this question. Well, just but, um, uh, it's so the there's Machiavelli a great conspiracy too. Uh, in the Florentine history. Since we're you know I'm just bringing that in. 
Um, the Potsy conspiracy, right? Um, what's really interesting about that is you have a bunch of armed men. They've got arms, uh, and they go into a church, and they successfully kill one brother, not so successfully, you know, they injure another, um, and and they're defeated. And the story that Machiavelli tells about it is just really interesting. I mean, they ride, you know, get up on the horse and they ride around the town, and they shout, "Liberty, liberty, liberty!" And Machiavelli says that the people of Florence have been made deaf by Cosmo's generosity. And um, Lorenzo is able to stand up and give this brilliant speech in which he reminds them that everything he has in that city um, has been given to him freely. He's never taken anything. And that in attacking him, he's really attacking his benefactors, the people. And so it's a real test of sort of arms, different kinds of arms, perhaps conventional arms versus the arms that the Medici had really perfected the use of, which was the ability to exploit conventional ideas of virtue and mobilize them on behalf of their own personal power and protect themselves against attacks by their enemies by claiming to be, uh, you know, being, you know, claiming to be innocents of any crime that justifies those attacks. And you can see this also in the, again, just truly brilliant um, speech by Nicolo Uzzano before Cosmo is sent into exile. And Uzzano is trying to explain to his partisans why you can't just go straight after Cosmo right now. You can't try to kill him. You can't try to throw him out. He's too powerful. And he explains, you know, it's one thing for us to know that we have justice on, the, on our side, that he does want to be a tyrant. They're conspiring. I mean, so I'm on the theme here. Uh, we know that he wants to be a tyrant, but we can't explain this. You know, our justice needs to be understood by others, and it can't be. What are his crimes? He's been nothing but merciful, kind, generous, you know, helpful. He goes through all the, all the virtues. Are there laws mm -hmm. that prohibit those behaviors? And, so, you know, and since they're not, there are no grounds for um, using arms against him. So the arms become entirely ineffectual and needed. So yeah, could I also just jump in? I mean, there, there's also, um, I, would, I would suggest, um, a, a, and I, I don't know what you as, translator, um, you as translators think of this, but it seems to me that there's some words like liberality, <coughs> humanita, um, extraordinary, that are very ambivalent in Machiavelli. They seem to praise, they're words that seem to praise, and if you just read it, especially in translation, especially in a bad translation, not one that our colleagues present have, have made. Um, I'm a big fan of their translations because they retain the original words, so they translate them directly. Uh, you know, over and over, Machiavelli uses words like liberality, humanity, um, extraordinary, a happy, felice, also, in ways that you think that's wonderful. That must mean he's praising this guy. He must be telling us that this is the policy to follow. But in fact, they're almost always double-edged. Cosimo's liberality is basically a code word in a way for buying partisans, um, which is a way to corrupt a republic, as we've said. Um, Uzzano talks about Cosimo's extraordinary modes. Um, well, we read extraordinary and we think in English, you just think, oh, extraordinary, that means excellent, remarkable, and all that. But Machiavelli almost consistently uses, I think consistently uses extraordinary or to, to be uh, modes that are outside legal orders. And ordinary modes are modes that occur within established legal orders. So, you know, either you think, well, he thinks it's good to sometimes step out and use those extraordinary modes, or you think he's subtly warning people that those are, those are orders, uh, those are ways to destroy foundations of good order. Hi, um, excuse me. Um, I would like to introduce another dilemma because I think we are talking about here dilemmas. We cannot solve the dilemmas. The Machiavellian dilemma, a, a professor over there, the Confucius dilemma, a professor there, the dilemma of the friendship in the Godfather. <laughs> um, so we are going to be discussing this forever. <laughs> of the uh, ambivalence, ambivalence you mentioned, <coughs> of the concepts that we are dealing with in a kind of a unit of opposites. Mm. So I want to 
introduce another dilemma. Gandhi, is he a, for violence or non-violence? Gandhi. Me, if Gandhi is for violence or non-violence? Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is for, for, for the, for the uh, panel. And yeah, the factual truth of, of Gandhi's non-violence was violence. Another dilemma. Oh, no, okay, yeah, okay. Thank is you. he violent? <laughs> yeah. He, the, does he what Gandhi uh, led to was, uh, the, was the violence between the um, Hindus and the Muslims at the, in the founding of uh, Pakistan, you could say. Okay. That's your point. Conquest. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you for uh, raising that point, and we want to thank our panel and have lunch. <laughs>